Modules and Homological Algebra, Lecture 4, Free Structures. Let us start with the definition of a free semigroup. Let X be a non-empty set. Definition, a free semigroup on X is a pair which consists of a semigroup F of X and a map phi from X to F of X. This pair is supposed to satisfy the following condition. For any semigroup S and for any map Psi from X to S, there must exist a unique semigroup homomorphism eta from F of X to S, such that Psi is equal to eta after phi. In other words, the following diagram computes. So we have here X, F of X and the map Phi, and then X, S, and the map Psi, and there should exist a unique semigroup homomorphism eta from F of X to S, such that Phi and then eta is equal to Psi. Remark, directly from the definition, it is not clear whether free semigroups exist, but we will prove their existence later. We start with the following observation. Assume that f of x and phi is a free semigroup on x, not on s, on x. Observation, the identity map in the place of eta is the only semigroup homomorphism which makes the following diagram commutative. So we have here x, f of x, and the map phi, and also x, f of x, and the map phi. So the only eta which makes this diagram commutative is the identity map. Indeed, the identity map obviously makes this diagram commutative, and also the identity map is a semigroup homomorphism, so its uniqueness follows directly from the freeness axioms, which says that such homomorphism should be unique. Now we can use this observation to discuss uniqueness of free semigroups. Proposition, if exists, a free semigroup on X is unique up to a unique isomorphism. In other words, if we have two free semigroups on X, the first one is f of X comma phi, and the other one is f of X tilde comma phi tilde, then there is a unique isomorphism zeta from f of X to f of X tilde, such that phi tilde is equal to zeta after phi. Proof. Since both f of x and f of x tilde are free semigroups, we can consider the following diagram. So we have the map phi from x to f of x and the map phi tilde from x to f of x tilde. Since f of x is a free semigroup, there exists a unique map zeta from f of x to f of x tilde such that zeta after phi is equal to phi tilde. Since f of x tilde is a free semigroup, there exists a unique map xi from f of x tilde to f of x, such that phi is equal to xi after phi tilde. In particular, if you look at this diagram and compose zeta and xi, we get that the following diagram commutes. So we have x and the map phi from f of x repeated twice, and then we have xi after zeta from f of x to f of x. So since this diagram commutes, then if we use zeta and then xi, then we will get that this diagram commutes. And by our observation, it follows that xi after zeta is the identity map. And similar argument applied to f of x tilde gives us that zeta after xi is the identity map. In particular, zeta is an isomorphism. And the uniqueness of zeta follows directly from the axiom that such zeta must be unique, such that the corresponding part of this diagram commutes. And this completes the proof of uniqueness. So now let us discuss construction of free semigroups. Let X be a non-empty set. Consider the semigroup X cross of all non-empty finite words in the alphabet X. The semigroup operation on this semigroup is given by concatenation of words. So if you have a word x1, x2, and so on, xk, and a word y1, y2, and so on, ym, we can just write them one after another to get the word x1, x2, and so on, xk, y1, y2, and so on, ym. 
And we also have a natural map from X to X cross, which sends a letter X to the corresponding one letter word in X cross, which consists just of this letter X. We claim, and this is the main result for free semigroups, that the pair consisting of this semigroup X cross and this map phi is a free semigroup on X. Proof. Let S be any semigroup and let Psi from X to S be any map. For a word X1, X2 and so on XK in X cross, we define eta of this word as the element Psi of X1, star Psi of X2 and so on, star Psi of XK. This is an element in S. Then, if we apply this map eta to the concatenation of the words x1 x and so on xk and y1, y2 and so on ym, this means that we apply eta to the word x1, x2 and so on xk, y1, y2 and so on ym. And this is equal by this definition to psi of x1, star psi of x2 and so on, star psi of xk, star psi of y1 and so on, star psi of ym. And then this part, psi of x1, star psi of x2, and so on, star psi of xk, is exactly the image of x1, x2, and so on, xk after eta. And then we take the star here, the image of y1, y2, and so on, ym after eta. And this proves that eta is indeed a semigroup homomorphism. Moreover, directly by construction, eta after phi is equal to psi. So if we apply eta to x1, we get psi of x1. That's exactly the claims that eta after phi is equal to psi. And uniqueness of eta follows directly from the homomorphism axioms. So if we know the value of a homomorphism on all letters, we know them on all words because by the homomorphism axiom, they must be defined by this formula. And this completes the proof. So here are some examples. Example one, assume that X consists of one letter, little x. Then the semigroup of all words in one letter just consists of the words X, X square, X cube, and so on. And this is isomorphic to the additive semigroup of positive integers under the isomorphism, which sends the word X to the power I to the integer i. So here i is a positive integer. So the free semigroup on one letter is exactly the additive semigroup of all positive integers. Example two, let us now consider the alphabet consisting of two letters, x and y. Then the semigroup of all words in this letter is really, really big. So here is a list of all words for small lengths. So we have two words of length one, just letters X and Y. We have four words of length two. So these are XX, XY, YX, and YY. We have eight words of length three, XXX, XXY, XYX, YXX, XYY, YXY, YYX, and YYY. And in general, our semigroup X cross will have exactly two to the power n words of lengths n. So the number of words of a fixed length will grow as an exponential function. So this is a very big infinite semigroup. Okay, let us now move to the discussion of free monoids. Let X be a non-empty set. Definition, a free monoid on X is the pair which consists of the monoid f of X, and a map phi from x to f of x, such that for any monoid m and for any map psi from x to m, there exists a unique monoid homomorphism eta from f of x to m, such that psi is equal to eta after phi. In other words, the following diagram commutes. And we have a similar diagram as for semigroups. We have the map phi from x to f of x, the map psi from x to m, and there should exist a unique monoid homomorphism eta from f of x to m, which makes this diagram commutative. So the definition is exactly the same as for semigroups, but replacing the word semigroup by a word monoid. And remark from the definition, it is unclear whether free monoids exist, 
but we will construct them. We will show how to construct free monoids. So now let's discuss existence and uniqueness. First, the proposition, if exists, a free monoid on X is unique up to a unique isomorphism. Exactly the same proof as for semigroups works also for monoids. Now about the construction. Consider the monoid X asterisks of all finite words in the alphabet X. This is now a monoid, so the difference between X asterisk and X cross is just the empty word, and this is exactly this empty word which serves the role of the identity element in this monoid. And the operation, just like in the previous case, is concatenation of words. And we have, similarly to the previous case, the natural map phi from X to X asterisk, which sends a letter X to the corresponding one letter word. Theorem, the pair X asterisk and phi is a free monoid on X. And the proof is exactly the same as in the semigroup case. So the only difference is, of course, now we have a monoid. So we have to ensure that something is a monoid map. And this means that we send the additional identity element in our monoid X asterisk to the identity element of the target monoid. And that's it. Next, let us discuss free algebras. Let X be a non-empty set and let K be a field. Definition, a free unital associative K algebra on X is a pair which consists of a unital associative K algebra F of X and a map phi from X to F of X, such that for any unital associative K algebra A and for any map psi from X to A, there is a unique algebra homomorphism eta from F of X to A, such that psi is equal to eta after phi. In other words, a similar diagram as in the previous two cases commutes. And again, we see that the definition is very similar just by replacing the original structure semigroup or monoid by the new structure and algebra. And we recall that for us, an algebra is a unital associative algebra over some field K. Okay, existence and uniqueness. From the definition, it's not clear whether free algebras exists. So first of all, if exists, a free algebra on X is unique up to a unique isomorphism. This is proved exactly in the same way as for semigroups. Now about an explicit construction of free algebras. Consider the monoid X asterisk of all finite words in the alphabet X. Consider the monoid K algebra of this monoid. Then we have the map phi from X to this monoid K algebra, which sends a letter X to the corresponding one letter word in the alphabet X, and this one letter word we consider as a basis element in our monoid algebra. Theorem, the pair consisting of the monoid algebra of the free monoid on X and our map phi is a free algebra on X. And again, the proof is exactly the same as in the semigroup case. One can only note that if you want to define a k-linear map, it is enough to define its value on all basis elements. Then it uniquely extends to a k-linear map on the whole space by k-linearity. And we have an algebra where we have a natural basis consisting of the elements of some monoid. So this theorem follows from this corresponding theorem for monoids using k-linearity. Okay, and finally, let us discuss free groups. So this now will be a bit more complicated. Let X be a non-empty set. Definition, a free group on X is a pair which consists of a group F of X and the map phi from X to F of X, such that for any group G and for any map psi from X to G, there is a unique homomorphism eta from f of x to g, so this should be a group homomorphism, such that psi is equal to eta after phi. That is the following diagram commutes. So we have x, f of x, and the map phi, 
x, g, and the map psi, and we need the existence of the unique eta from f of x to g, such that this diagram commutes. So this definition is again very similar as the three previous definitions of free structures which we saw. And exactly as in the previous cases, it is not clear that these groups exist. However, exactly the same argument as in the previous cases shows that if a free group exists, then it is unique up to a unique isomorphism. So uniqueness is just the general argument which is valid for more or less any free structures. So how to establish existence? Existence is established by a concrete construction, but for groups, this construction is a bit more complicated than in the previous cases. So let us do now the construction. So we want to construct a free group on X. Let X tilde be a disjoint copy of X. So we double X by putting tildes on the letters of X. Let Y be the union of X and X tilde. And now let us consider the free monoid Y asterisk on Y. Let tilde be the minimal congruence on this free monoid which contains the following relations. We want for any x in x that x times x tilde is equivalent to epsilon, the empty, the identity element, the empty word, and x tilde x should also be equivalent to the empty word epsilon for any x in x. So tilde is just the minimal congruence which contains these binary relations. Let us define f of x as the quotient of y tilde by this congruence. By definition, this is a monoid. We took a monoid y tilde, we took a congruence and took the quotient. So f of x so far is just a monoid. And we define the map phi from x to f of x by sending a letter x to the tilde equivalence class of y asterisk, which contains the one letter word x. Theorem f of x, comma, phi, so this pair defined above, is a free group on x. So now this theorem is already more complicated because so far we don't even know whether f of x is a group. We have to prove this. Proof. So as we mentioned by construction, f of x is just a monoid. Also by construction, each element x in f of x is invertible with inverse being x tilde. So this is because of the definition, our tilde contains these relations, which mean exactly that x tilde is the inverse of x. Any element of f of x is a product of some x's and x tildes, and all these elements are invertible. So each element of f of x is invertible. In other words, f of x is a monoid in which all elements are invertible, so it is a group. So we have just established that our f of x constructed as a monoid is in fact a group. Now we have to prove the free property for this group f of x. And to do this, let us recall the factorization lemma from the previous lectures, which was formulated as follows. Let S and T be two semigroups and phi be a semigroup homomorphism from S to T. Let tilde be a congruence on S such that each class of tilde is a subset of some class of the kernel of phi. Then the homomorphism phi factors through the canonical projection onto S modulo tilde. So this was the factorization lemma which we formulated and proved in connection to the first isomorphism theorem. So now let us try to use this lemma in our particular situation. Let G be any group and Psi any map from X to G. Note that any group is a monoid, so G is a monoid and we have a map Psi from X to G. So by the free property of the free monoid Y asterisk, there is a unique monoid homomorphism eta from this free monoid to G, to the monoid G, which sends each element x to psi of x and each element x tilde to the inverse of psi of x. 
Also note that because of this definition, eta applied to x, x tilde is equal to eta applied to epsilon. This is because eta applied to x, x tilde is eta of x times eta of x tilde, which is psi of x times psi of x inverse, which is the identity element. And similarly, eta applied to x tilde x is equal to eta of the identity. This means exactly that our congruence tilde is included into the kernel of eta. So each class of tilde is a subset of the kernel of eta. So we can apply our factorization lemma. And so we have that our map eta factors through the canonical projection onto y asterisk modulo our congruence tilde. And this gives us a group homomorphism eta overlined from this quotient to G. And directly from the construction, we have that eta overlined applied to X is equal to psi of X because of this definition. So we have a group homomorphism which makes our diagram commutative. Finally, we need to establish that it is unique. If zeta is any group homomorphism from our quotient of y asterisk modulo our congruence to G, and if zeta is a group homomorphism such that zeta of x is equal to psi of x, so then zeta applied to x tilde is equal to the inverse of psi of x. This is simply because x tilde is an inverse of x, zeta is a group homomorphism, and any group homomorphism sends inverses to inverses. So this is true in our quotient y asterisk modulo tilde. As any element in y tilde is a word in y, from the homomorphism axiom, we see we just established that zeta and eta overlined, they coincide on all letters in y, then just the homomorphism axiom implies that they coincide on the whole free monoid y asterisk. And this completes the proof. So to sum up from the above construction, we see that the elements of the free group on X are equivalence classes of words, but the alphabet is not X. The alphabet is X union with X inverse, a disjoint union of another copy of X. And with respect to the equivalence classes given by that the empty word is equivalent to X X inverse and the empty word is equivalent to X inverse X for any letter X. And given two words in this alphabet, one needs to realize that it might be a non-trivial problem to find out whether these two words are equivalent or not. It's not too difficult, but it's also not too obvious. So the elements of the free group are certain equivalence classes in a certain monoid. So the construction is a bit more involved. So here is an example. Example one, the additive group of integers is a free group on the singleton alphabet X consisting of the letter one, so the integer one. Indeed, for any group G and any element little g in G, there is a unique group homomorphism eta from Z to G, which sends one to this element little g. Namely, this homomorphism sends the integer k to the k's power of this element little g. This is exactly the free property. So the free group on one element is isomorphic to the additive group of integers. And the free group on two elements, this is our example two, this is a huge object. In particular, it contains a free semigroup on two elements. And we already mentioned that that semigroup is really big because if you take the gross function, how the words in two letters grow, when we increase the length of the word, this growth is exponential. And it is very nice exercise to prove that the free group on two letters actually contains a free semigroup on two letters. The free property immediately gives you a map from the free semigroup on two letters to the free group on two letters. And it's a nice exercise to show that this map is in fact injective. 
Some problems and questions at the end. Question one, prove that the canonical map phi from X to F of X is injective for any algebraic structure. Question two, explain why the free algebra is defined as the monoid algebra of the free monoid X asterisk and not as the monoid algebra of the free monoid X cross. Question three, define the notion of a free commutative monoid and prove existence and uniqueness of such monoids. Question four, formulate and prove the uniqueness statement for free groups with all details. And question five, formulate the notion of a free ring and prove its existence and uniqueness with all details. Thank you very much and see you next time.